everyone. I'm Dr. Rita Roy, CEO of the National Spine Health Foundation. We're here to improve spinal health care for everyone. One of the ways that we do that is by bringing you Spine Talks, where we provide unparalleled access to world-class experts like these doctors who are joining me today. I'm going to turn the program over to our moderator, Dr. Tom Schuler, who's the chairman of our Medical and Scientific Board. Tom? Thank you, Dr. Roy. So we're so excited to be here in Chicago. What we do in Spine Talks is reach out to the top experts in the world to get answers to questions that hopefully help you get better spine care. One of the beauties of today is we're in Chicago at the North American Spine Society, which is, which is a global meeting to improve and advance spinal health care through, through knowledge, through education, through understanding the innovations. With that, we have three of our distinguished medical and scientific board members, Dr. Lehman from New York, Dr. Good from Virginia, and Dr. Gum from Louisville, Kentucky. So gentlemen, can you introduce yourselves? Yeah, great, thanks Tom. My name is Ron Lehman. I'm a spine surgeon from Columbia University in New York City at the Ox Spine Hospital. And I really specialize in doing the majority of surgeries, but using assist technology like robotics to help make those cases go more smoothly and get a better understanding. One of the things I think that we've really learned now over time is by using these additive technologies, we not only can do things a little bit more efficient and faster, but also with smaller incisions, quicker recovery, all the things I think now that patients expect from us. Awesome. I'm Chris Good. I'm a spine surgeon at the Virginia Spine Institute. Uh, I uh, take care of people through all different types of spinal problems. Uh, the majority of my people, I would say I treat non-operatively, lots of focus on, on rehab and those type of things. Um, when we get into surgical procedures, really my passion has uh, gotten into a spine technology and things that we can do to make surgery safer, uh, more accurate, and really working to, to develop a lot of these, these types of technologies. Cool. Um, thanks, Tom and Rita. Um, I'm Jeff Gum. I'm at Leatherman Spine Center in Louisville, Kentucky currently, uh, orthopedic spine train. Um, I'm going to use Christian's term, but my passion is really in robotics and um, adult spinal deformity. So I do everything as far as procedure wise and take care of a lot of different patients from pediatrics to adults, but uh, recently really pushed a lot with regards to in the OR and research with robotics and uh, Another component of that is to uh, reducing opioid use in patients. It's been a, a new passion of mine uh, because of where our center is located. So I appreciate the invite and looking forward to the talk. That was great. Well, one of the big advantages today is the technological evolution that has occurred, which truly is giving us the ability to perform modern miracles on people and get them back to their lives. We had a fascinating speaker at this conference, a uh, blind mountaineer who's scaled Mount Everest amongst other mountains. And he, he gave us a statement today, which I think is so impactful. It's about not why did this happen to me, but what can I do about it now? And that's really what we're here to talk about today is to say, what can you do about your problem now? If you have severe neck pain, back pain, a, a spine issue, what is it you can do to help yourself? And, and so showcasing some of this technology which is being presented at this meeting, which these gentlemen have helped pioneer, we're gonna talk about robotics and, and using all this new computer technology to do a better job of improving our lives. So with that, Ron, what, what, what are your thoughts about robotic surgery and robotic technology? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting time and probably in spine surgery, more interesting now over the last few years and certainly the next five to 10 years, probably that we had since the late 1990s when pedicle screws really sort of came into being. Um, and all of us are- What's a pedicle screw? Pedicle screws are devices that we use to place into the vertebrae or the bone itself of the spine that help to uh, connect the spine to fuse them together. So we often hear about patients get a spine fusion. Typically what that means is we get some screws that go into the bone and then they're connected to rods which help hold them into place. So it's kind of like putting an internal cast in a person to let the bones heal. Exactly, very, very similar. So how does, how does robotics affect this? So robotics now allows us, and the three of us were actually trained uh, in, uh, by the same people in, in similar ways where we did surgeries that were you know, large surgeries, with really large incisions uh, to do these uh, spinal reconstructions. Um, and now that we realize we can use uh, things like robotic spine surgery to help place these pedicle screws going into the bone to help with fusions for scoliosis cases, which is the twisting of the spine, for cases like spondylolisthesis, where there's a slippage of one of the bones on the other. 
But to place these screws incredibly accurately, and we've all published uh, recently now many papers over the last year showing essentially over 99% accuracy with placing these screws with robotic technology. Um, and so what it does now is it allows um, surgeons, whether you have 20 years of experience or just starting out, uh, a very similar amount of ability to do these things safely and accurately um, that really benefits the patient. Um, so I think that's a big advance that we really come into being. And once again, these things, just like our iPhones, will continue to get better as the years unfold. Okay. So, so Chris, we're talking about instrumenting the spine, which may be a little confusing to the public. So let's expand on that instrumenting the spine a little bit, what we're trying to do, and then how in your opinion, this robotics comes into play on that. Sure. So uh, just to use a personal story, if we go back in time, Ron was mentioning pedicle screws. Uh, my dad managed a ski area, and when I was a kid, like 10 days old, he fell out of a chairlift and he crushed his back, okay? So in the 70s, he had surgery, a neurosurgeon, and all they could do was open up his back and make sure his nerves weren't pinched, but they didn't have any way to fix the bones that were broken, really. And so all they did was they took bone graft, like crunched up bone, and they just packed it along the other bones, like grout or cement, and they just put him in a body cast, and he had to just lay there for months hoping things would weld together. Well, the reality is that doesn't work very good. And so those surgeries that were done, you know, we hear about these from the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. We weren't good at getting people fixed. And you spend months in a body cast, and then the fusion doesn't heal. So it's like you have a broken bone that never mended in your body. Okay, so that one of the great steps in the evolution was developing fixation devices, so ways we could actually hook onto the spine uh, and then uh, stabilize things. And this started with little hooks and wires, and then ultimately what we call pedicle screws, which are currently kind of, in my opinion, kind of the best and most used way of attaching to the spine. And so if my dad had his injury today, we'd be able to put these little screws in and fix all the bones. And because this is holding inside, you get up and walk the same day or the next day after surgery instead of laying in a body cast for three months. And so that was a huge you know, evolution that took place 80s into the 90s and we're getting better and better. Now, the spine anatomy is very, very delicate and everything we do as spine surgeons, we have to hit a bullseye every time. You know, if I need to be here, there's a nerve here, there's a spinal cord here, there's a blood vessel here, so we really have to hit these bullseyes. And so using spine technology, such as robotics, allows us to be much more accurate with the things that we are doing. And the better I am at, at hitting a bullseye, I can fix the bone stronger, I can avoid my, or uh, try and avoid my, my screw being too near a nerve. And if we can fix people really, really strong and avoid any problems. Now, you know, you get up, you have the same, most of our patients get up and walk as soon as they get out of the recovery room after surgery these days. And so the, the newest step in this evolution, I think, is really the technology that allows all different types of surgeons the ability to really have great accuracy as we're planning out and performing these surgeries. And it's all about improving safety, safety for patients, right? We know if you have a surgery, you want the surgery to go well, you don't want a complication, you don't want to need another surgery. And one of the great things that our research is starting to show is that by using robotics and the spine technology, we're able to take care of patients with lower rates of complications when they do need surgery. So a little bit like the uh, stealth missiles that we have now, with the guidance, we can get them exactly where we need them. And I think that's a beauty. One of the things about the instrumentation is to say, and just for the public to understand, is that these screws we're putting in allows to grab a hold of each vertebral body and hold it stiff and get it to heal. So like Chris's father, they didn't have any way to hold the spine, so they put a cast on the outside of the body, but with all the soft tissue in between, things move around. But with this technology today, we can grab each vertebra, hold it stiff, and it's that stiffness which allows the bones to heal. And so that's really the big advantage is having this stealth technology to get those screws precisely where we want without risk. Yeah. So Jeff, why don't you build on this? Yeah, so I, I agree that with what both Ron and Chris, even you, Tom, talked about as far as the accuracy and how important that is. The, the other component of it with robotics, which uh, probably doesn't get mentioned as much in the public, is really the planning component of it, right? So obviously we have to be accurate. And we know that in this type of technology, whether it's navigation or robotics, has helped us improve that accuracy. And that's going to continue to evolve. But really, you also want your surgeon, if you're undergoing surgery, to, to be as prepared as possible and to understand how to be efficient in the operating room. So regardless of what literature or studies you look at, the, the more efficient the surgeon is, right, the less time on the table is always correlated with typically a better outcome, right, as long as you're still doing the right things. 
And so robotics kind of forces you to plan out front, right? And Ron, I've heard Ron talk a lot about uh, this on the podium it's, and he correlates this to airline, right? So if you're hopping on a plane and you understand the process of all the planning that goes into that, right? There's a very detailed as far as the weight on the plane, as far as the mileage they have to fly and et cetera. And uh, it's interesting how a lot of surgeons and us in the past, I'm sure we're all guilty of it with it prior to this technology where we walk into the operating room not as pre prepared as we are today because the robotic component of it allows us to plan the size of the screw, the length of the screw, the length of the rod, right? What kind of correction we're going to do, things like that. So the planning component has made us more prepared walking into the operating room and much more efficient in the operating room when we're performing the surgeries. And Tom, I'd yeah. like to ask a question sure. as a patient. Um, I'm an informed patient, so I'm a, I have a medical background, but I'm the recipient of a very successful spinal fusion um, that was done with uh, robotic surgery. And one of the things that I think patients often think about is with all this new technology that's being um, discovered and the research work that these experts are doing, should I wait a little bit for better technology to come along? Like maybe, maybe right now is not the best time for me to fix. I should wait to have surgery. And I'd love to hear the experts' opinions on, you know, should, should we wait for something better to come along or is now a good time to fix my, my problem? I think even, even more importantly than maybe the technology, sort of the right time to consider having surgery. And what I sort of always break it down to patients, I ask, tell them to ask themselves two basic questions. Do you think about it more you don't think about it? And does it affect more of your life than it doesn't affect? And that's sort of the right time to have surgery. You know, I do think we have the ability now to do surgery at an incredibly high level, much higher than even seven or eight years ago, and certainly much higher than the 1970s. Um, but I think at this point, much like anything else, whether we're talking about total joint replacements or spine surgery, if you're having significant issues in terms of you know, neurologic compromise, which means you may have some numbness, weakness, tingling pain of your leg or arm, um, those are things that really drive you to consider surgery after trying all the non-operative things like physical therapy and medications and adjusting your activities. Um, and then from that standpoint, uh, based upon what we've already spoken about now is that we have a uh, an incredible ability to think about the surgeries ahead of time, know what the surgery should look like, and then we can plan all these things with robotic technology and a lot of the artificial intelligence and machine learning that we're doing. So we have it, it's very objective. Um, and this is really probably the last three or four years we've had such objective ways to know that A, should you have surgery? B, if we're doing the surgery, are we doing it the correct way? And C, at the end, did we achieve our goals? Um, and so I guess the short answer is, it's, a, it's the, a great time to have surgery if you need it now, and it will only continue to get better. And I think this is the evolution that we're really uh, facing at this time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it also, I mean, it really depends on be, becoming informed and finding someone you can find out about, right? So there are some problems that can cause tremendous disability, and we have great fixes with very little downside, yeah. right? And then there are some problems that are a much bigger deal to treat. It's a lot harder to go through, right? And so you really want to understand not only how is this affecting my life, but what is the fix like? What is the upsides and the downsides, right? right? Like having... All the light bulbs burned up in your house could make it almost unusable. And having someone come in to fix that is pretty simple. You should do that. Yeah. You know, if the foundation's crumbling on your house and the only way to fix it is to tear the whole thing down and rebuild another one, a little bit more planning you want to go through to decide when the right time is to go through something like that. And so that's where really getting an understanding of what condition do I have, you know, what would it be like to go through the different treatments. And obviously, we love it. If, if, if the simpler treatments work, I think you should stick with that as long as your quality of life is good. Um, but there are a lot of people who, whether it's fear or need to work or whatever, they start to get into a situation of disability, right? And then you start to get to the point where you can't get around and you get some nerve damage. And people end up in this situation where they're kind of looking at an inevitable surgery, but for all these reasons, they delay so long that by the time they have it, they don't have as good a result as, as they could have. Yep. Uh, and so that's, that's it's, and, and it, there's no what to say to you as a patient because we're all in different boats with these conditions. Right. But I think that's the thing is, is understanding if you're doing well, taking every good year you get and kicking the can down the road, yeah. it'd be the best thing to do. 
Yeah. But we don't want to wait so long that we've jeopardized our success. That's yeah. great. No, I, I, I agree a ton with Chris and Ron again. You know, as the third person on the chain here, second time around, uh, they're, they're either <laughs> making my life easier or harder. But from the patient perspective, I think that I wouldn't make a decision on surgery based on technology available at the time, right? So obviously different centers and different surgeons utilize technology that can be beneficial. So that's important in the decision-making decision process. But as far as the time, what Chris was saying, we, we talk about duration of symptoms, right? So how long has this been bothering you and what's the detriment to your lifestyle that Ron's talking about? And so if you're miserable and you can't do things you enjoy doing and there's a solution that matches your goals, that's the right time for surgery, right? And the other part of this, which in our specialty, other folks don't do a great job with, is really aligning those goals or explaining those goals to where they make sense, right? So one, you have to have an accurate diagnosis of what the problem is. That's very important from a patient surgeon perspective. Number two, your surgeon needs to be able to relay what the goals are with the surgery, what they could tackle, what they could accomplish, right? And it's interesting because the public has a perception of fusion that is typically not positive, right? Because a lot of folks know somebody that's had a fusion and has had more surgeries, right? Or there's other problems with it. And I think the two reasons for that lie within, it's not done for the right reason, right? So if you don't have the diagnosis right, you're not doing it for the right reason, the outcome's not gonna be good. Number two, if the goals weren't well explained or the expectations aren't well explained to the patient, they're not gonna be happy with that. So. To me, finding a surgeon that you're comfortable with, that does a good job with diagnosis, has accurate or has access to these technologies that makes life easier and, and potentially better from an outcome perspective, and then communicates well enough to you to tell you what to expect afterwards. That's the, that, to me, that's the perfect scenario of it's the right time for surgery, but we, I think everybody here on the panel agrees surgery should be the last option. Right, and people should fail non-operative treatment prior to that. So there's a lot of factors that go into that. But to answer your question, yeah. I don't think you should delay surgery because of the new technology coming down the road. Obviously, we've seen a lot of new and exciting things that we're going to be happy about uh, to, to utilize in our operating room. But I wouldn't delay something if if, if the everything else aligns right now. So for me, when I look at this, it depends on the person's problem, and I think this is building on what's already been said is. If your problem is back pain, if your problem is neck pain, and it's not related to a tumor or fracture, we're talking about a degenerative condition, which is the preponderance of where symptoms come from, then you can live with that your whole life. But then the question comes down is, are you hurting the quality of your life? Are you not exercising because of that back pain or neck pain, which then has an impact on your heart, your lungs, your happiness, and all those things. So you have to take into account the whole picture of not just what's going on with your back. Now, if you're getting arm pain or leg pain, yeah. that means you're hitting a nerve, and that can lead to permanent problems. So that needs to be followed closely, and that shouldn't be delayed. Now, having said that we understand, are we treating back pain or leg pain? Are we treating neck pain or arm pain or a combination? It comes down to the quality of your life. Yeah. If with the technology we have today, and again, I've said this before, these modern miracles that we have, where we can improve the quality of people's lives, restore them back to their function, then, then the time to do it is today because our technology is overwhelmingly advanced. Will it be better in the future? Yes, but so will be computers and cars and everything else. And so the answer comes down to, how is your life going? What is the quality of your life? And can I get the treatment that I need? And that means, number one, not only having access to the treatment, but then having world-class experts that can provide that treatment to you and, and get you the best result. And so ultimately, to me, that's the time. Well, we're gonna to shift topics a little bit. Now we're talking about these great technological advances. And I wanna throw a little uh, mud in the water. So when doesn't it work? When's it a problem? And, and what's the backup for that? Yeah. We're yeah, gonna start true. with Jeff since he's <laughs> always been the last yeah, man. Since I was picking on him, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one. <laughs> so it's a great example. So on, on Wednesday of last week, right, our system, our EMR went down. I, I get a phone call. I get out of the gym at six in the morning. I get a phone call at 6.05 getting in my truck to go to work, and the, the OR saying, hey, our EMR is down. I won't use the trade name. What, what's an EMR? E uh, so electronic medical record. So essentially, you know, if you think, look in a hospital 15 years ago, doctors are signing things and writing paper. Now it's all electronic, right? So the way we navigate with orders, with um, notes or document things in the hospital, right, is, is all electronic now. We're on computers. 
like the rest of the world. It's like when Southwest Airlines computers went down yeah. and I couldn't it, get on my flight. Exactly. <laughs> and so what was interesting is, so EMR goes down, right? So we have six hospitals within the system. Three of the hospitals instantly shut their water down, right? We're not even going to attempt to do things. So we're, the campus I was at, we started to plug along. Well, what follows is imaging goes down, right? So What's imaging? The imaging is so being able to look at x-rays, being able to look at MRIs, being able to look at CT scans. So this is my ammo to plan the surgery, right? So this is what I need to get my surgery accomplished. So we have all the ORs filled with patients and we're plugging along with our first surgery and all the imaging stuff goes down. Right. And so if you think about the way robotics or what we call navigation, which is essentially GPS. Right. So if you take the robotic arm out of it, you, we could also use GPS and that could track where we're at very precisely uh, within space to help us place those screws or cages that Ron was talking about earlier. So all of that goes down. Right. So the question is, what do we do? Right. Does our day stop? Right. And the surgeons that were able to freehand place these screws without the technology, right? Those surgeons actually progress with their day, right? Everybody else that relies on only that technology cancel the rest of their day, right? Was it safe? Yeah, it was safe. Is it an ideal outcome? No, because if you plan on using technology like that, you want to be able to use it. But it was a very eye-opening experience of what, how much we rely on this, right? So in I think everybody in the room and everybody listening, if your phone, you lose your phone for a day, it changes the way you function on a day-to-day -day basis for the most part. So that was, a, to me, a great experience of how much we rely on this type of technology and what we do. It's good that we've migrated to technology that makes it easier for us and safer for us, but it also is a little scary how much we rely on it. So that's, that's the front end component of it. If in the operating room that stuff is not functioning correctly is really what your question was, then the biggest thing is having surgeons understand when that's going wrong, right? That's the most important part, right? And all of us up here teach other surgeons how to use this technology. And one of the biggest things I try to emphasize and teach is to identify that it's not functioning properly. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. So that's very important from a surgeon that utilizes any sort of technology is to, to understand when it's not working properly. I'll let the other guys finish the question. I think it. I think we're in an interesting place. There was a time when we were really a little bit more on the cutting edge of this. And if you were going to use it, you had to be able to do it the traditional way. And then you could add this in, but you couldn't depend on it. How long ago was that? Oh, I mean, 10, 12 years ago, yeah. uh, even a little bit beyond that. You know, And if you look at a lot of other things that, that are now normal in the world, there was a point where only a few like bleeding edge people used them and everybody thought it was crazy. And then you got to this point where people started to use them, but you couldn't depend on them. And then you get to the point where you don't even think about it anymore. You know, we used to take gallbladders out by making a huge incision and opening everything up. And there was a time period when, when some crazy surgeons started putting in little cameras and everybody said, oh, that takes too long. There, you, what if the camera quits working, right? And there was this time period when as a general surgeon, you had to know how to take it out old school or with the camera. And the reality is we've advanced so far beyond that now because the cameras are so much better and the training is so much better that no one even needs to know how to do it that way because it always works with the camera. And it would be, it would be you know, on the verge of like malpractice to, to actually take it out the other way because it, it doesn't work as well. And we're at this point where a lot, with a lot of these spine technologies where they're becoming commonplace, they're utilized all the time, they're not infallible. And so it requires the surgeon to be aware. But if you look at the NASA astronauts and what they used to have to do and what they do now, it's a screen and everything's happening automated and their job is to like hit one button yeah. if, if something is going wrong. And I think it's really exciting that we're in the middle phase and I'm looking forward to even the next phase, which is where this really does have backup systems and sensors built in and things that really, that, that just make it even more and more and more uh, dependable. But for right now, if you're having surgery, it really is important that you have a surgeon who is on the cutting edge, but also has you know all these uh, foundational principles you know and tools in their toolbox. Because right now, you really there's a lot of ways to solve a problem, and you if you know a lot of ways to solve one problem, you can pick the best one. And I think that's really important this decade of spine surgery. Yeah, I think really to sort of piggyback on that a little bit, and even what Jeff spoke about before, you know, one of the re these reasons that technology were created is not because they weren't needed. Right? So the reason 
phones were created and we talk about this all the time I and mean, you're a little bit older than me but we remember the Jetsons cartoon when we were <laughs> younger and I'm like oh my god we can actually look at a person on the phone in front of my kids don't know the difference and they're teenagers right that's all they've ever known you know for us now it becomes commonplace um, but I think when you look at these technologies they were created because they realized and people realized there had to be a more straightforward way to do it there had to be an easier, safer way to do it um, because not everyone performs surgery the same. Not everyone flies a plane the same. You know, so the airline industry is a classic example. You know, for 30 years, the instance of airline issues in terms of crashes and malfunctions was skyrocketing. And what did they do? They basically created an autopilot system. And so now after takeoff and before landing, 98% of your flight is via autopilot. So most people don't know that. And the instance now in the last 15 years of auto accident or airline accidents going down is almost insignificant. You rarely hear about it because all this stuff is automated. We talk about the industrial revolution with making cars. It was great to make a Model T Ford, but when there's a thousand humans on the conveyor belt in the assembly line, there's going to be errors. Now, Tesla, 96% of their vehicle is made by robots and it takes 90 minutes to make a Model 3. It's almost unbelievable when you think about it yeah. because everything's automated. It takes any of the fluff out of the system and it's very reproducible. And I think overall, those things make it better. But there are times, like everyone's alluded to, where technology fails, it doesn't work, there's a generator issue, whatever it ends up being. Um, and it's important to know how to do the surgery multiple different ways um, because there are cases where robotics may not work or navigation may not work or uh, imaging like x-ray imaging in the ore may not work and so you have to be able to do it fortunately we were all trained in the classic way um, and so those things are, are great but there certainly are some surgeons uh, now that you know do it a certain way and they do it a certain way every time and so I think even Dr. Roy as you were speaking about before is even when you're thinking about entertaining getting surgery you realize you're at that point and nothing else has you know worked and you know you're now having issues with not being able to go to work or exercise or do the things that you enjoy in life is to get several opinions um, and so Such a good point. You know, Jeff's from Louisville, Kentucky, and he has a truck, which makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> but if you're going to buy a pickup truck, and I use this to patients all the time, if you're going to buy a pickup truck, you're not going to go to the first dealership on the corner and just pay whatever they ask. Yep. You're going to do some research. You're going to go online. You're going to visit two or three different places. You're going to look at other sites to say, what's the best price? How is this going to work? Because if you buy that first pickup truck and it doesn't work in a year, that's worth 50%. When you're taking care of your health and your spine health, it's much more important. Um, so you really want to make that sure that decision is the correct one. Can, can I ask a question to the panel? So we've been talking about um, fancy carpentry with screws and, and things like bone packing, and, and that, that's, it's so cool to hear about that. Um, and, and then you've mentioned recently GPS, navigation. Mm -hmm. And we're talking a little bit about navigation in the operating room. And I think a lot of times people don't understand what it looks like in the operating room from a spine surgeon's perspective. Um, there's imaging that happens in the operating room. Like, wow, why, why is that happening? And how does that happen? And how does navigation help you with that? Why, why do we need to do that? And you know, some, some of the ideas that um, Dr. Lehman is mentioning that things were invented to make things better. And so navigation is one of those things that has been invented to make spine surgery better. Can you talk a little bit about the use of imaging in the operating room? and how navigation works? You know, well, let's define what imaging is. I mean, yeah. historically, when we did surgeries, we opened the patient up and we looked directly at the anatomy. And then we would use live x-ray fluoroscopy where we would shoot pictures. And so now this is the next step where we're using CT-generated information fed into a computer, yep. then tie it back to the patient. And, and in addition to what you're asking, I'd also like to talk a little bit about how, how this works how you put a probe in the pelvis, and then we're working on a mobile spine at other levels. So with that in mind, can, can, can we, Chris, why don't you start? Yeah. So I think most patients are familiar with the idea of getting an X-ray or an MRI or a CT scan, right? So the doctor's got a picture of your body in whatever your problem is, right? And so um, it used to be I would look at that scan and then the way I would go in to fix it was I would cut you open, I would look at the bones, and because I know the shape of the bones, I could figure out where on the bone to go to do whatever I needed to do surgically. But it was all about vision. And so 
if I can see what's going inside your body without having to cut everything open, that makes the surgery less invasive, less painful, easier to recover from, okay? Now, navigation and these computer planning softwares, we take your scan, um, think of it like a blueprint, and now I can take your scan and I can put it in software and I can actually plan on the software what surgery I wanna do. So I have a picture of your bone and I'm gonna say, oh, I wanna put a screw right here. And I say, no, I wanna move it a little. I wanna rotate it a little. I wanna do this to this nerve. And I can plan that all out and think it through perfectly before I ever get to the operating room, okay? And one benefit is now, I don't have to cut everything open to get in there and look. I can work through a little teeny incision and I can have this technology help me to accomplish those goals without having to directly see or visualize everything. That is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Another, absolutely amazing. another really cool part of this is any tool that I may have. Let's say that somebody has, somebody has a screwdriver, right? Well, if I want to put a screwdriver in and tighten something, I've got to see it go in the screw and I've got to hold it at the right angle and I've got to twist it, right? Well, now a lot of our instruments have little markers that stick off them, little reflectors. So there's a camera watching my tool. And the camera knows where my tool is, and it shows me my tool on your scan. So I'm looking at the blueprint on a screen of the perfect surgery. I've got it all planned out. And now when I go to put my tool in, instead of having to see it with my own eyes, I can put the tool in. I can see it's going just where I want on your scan. That's called navigation. Okay, and so if I move my hand this way, I can see. So I can line up exactly what I want, not just by looking at the patient, but by looking at what's going on on the scan and the plan. And so as we're going through the steps of the surgery, this helps us to open up the patient less, work through smaller incisions, be more accurate. And if I've got a blueprint for every step I want to do building the house, and then I can actually watch each step of the house go up, superimposed on top of the blueprint, I can make sure everything's going going along accurately. So when we talk about navigation, that's this process whereby some kind of camera is watching the instruments and showing what's going on on the scans. When we talk about robotics, that's somehow this computer plan is telling an arm where to move. We, we programmed it where to move, but the robotic arm is planning where to move to help us work. And what we're doing now is a combination. So we have a plan, we have a robotic arm moving around, and we have the cameras watching everything to make sure it's going according to plan. And so robotics, navigation, planning, these things have all come together and are, are really adding to uh, really this, this technology that we're using to do these surgeries. Yeah, it's just it, a miracle. I and, mean, it's just a miracle. And to take that even a, a, another step within where technology is going, and so, Chris mentioned the navigation component where you move your instruments in space and you look at a screen to tell you where that is in space, right? So uh, I, I think that makes sense. And a good way to think about it, you know, if you're traveling from point A to B uh, 15, 20 years ago, right? So I remember going on a road trip with my grandparents and we pull out a map, right? You highlight the path or you look at different options, right? And the question is, is nowadays who uses a, a hard copy map to travel from point A to point B? None of us do for the most part, right? So we have different apps in our phone, right? There's Google Maps, et cetera. Waze is one that talk about efficiency. It tells you which, which pathway is more efficient because of traffic. And so that's a good way to think about these assist technologies that we're using is so you know, navigation shows you where you're at. Robotics plus navigation shows you where you're at, plus it points to where you, you should put your screw or instrumentation based on what you planned. And uh, another component of it that we haven't brought up yet is augmented reality or, or, or virtual reality. So the, the way navigation uses right now, the information that gets fed to us is it's up on a screen. So we have to look away from the surgery and look up on a screen. Well, now we're taking that a step further and we're taking that information and we're overlaying it on top of our anatomy. And so Chris said he used to just open everybody up, look, that's the anatomy. Now you've exposed it. You've taken muscle off the spine, which is not bad if you need to, right? But a lot of these procedures, we've gone to the point to where we don't have to do that, right? The incision's a lot smaller. That helps your recovery. Right. You're able to recover a little quicker, a lot less pain, et cetera. But the reason we're able to do that is we take this information that's very accurate, right? Very detailed and we look at it, or we overlay it on the patient so it allows us to be more efficient, not have to look up, and that gives us another, it's like navigation on steroids. It's like literally it. having x-ray vision. Correct. In the OR. It's Ron, amazing. you got anything to add? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that was the that's the best moniker, but I think it's very similar to playing video games today. Yeah. Right? Can you, you can put an that? Oculus yeah. on, and you yeah. can sort of look around, and you're there, as opposed to Pong when it first came out, you know, 40 yeah. years ago yeah. for us, where, yeah. you know, it couldn't be less two-dimensional than that. Um, and so I think it now gives you this ability to sort of, once again, understand where everything is in space. Very similar to your brain and knowing where your fingers are at and where your feet are at and where your legs are at. You know, these systems are basically an external brain right. for everything that we do. And so it knows where each component is and, once again, gives you real-time sort of feedback. Um, it allows you to do a lot more than we used to be able to do not that long ago. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the real estate market. There's an adage out there, location, 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 in terms of what property do you want to have or, or sell or control. And in patient care, it comes down to patient selection, patient selection, patient selection. Now, this is assuming that the team providing care has access to all the best treatments out there and can select what's right for the patient. Then it matters on what the patient's anatomy is, what their problem is, what their ability to overcome that is when the surgeon uses technology. So, so, gentlemen, I'd just like you to talk a little bit. We've talked about fusion technology with this, and, and I'd, I'd like your answer to the patient selection, patient selection, patient selection comment in regards to the fusion. But then also the follow-up question is in regards to robotics and augmented reality and all this, how does this apply beyond fusion to disc replacements, regenerative medicine, injections, yeah. what, whatever, microsurgeries, if, if you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think you know the most important thing is that when you're entertaining surgery, um, and you know the classic thing that you certainly you know read on Doctor Google and in the newspapers is that all fusions are bad, uh, and you alluded to this before, is that if you do a fusion for you know 100% back pain, we usually tell patients that's a 50-50 proposition. 50% of people get better, 50% of people may stay the same, get worse, or get different. Typically, when you have a pinched nerve, where you get numbness, weakness, tingling, pain down the leg, or uh, in the neck or the cervical spine, same thing with the arm, those patients we know that if you do the surgery because of a pinched nerve or because the spinal cord is being compressed, in those situations, back pain and neck pain get better. Um, and so many different studies have sort of looked at this. And so I think if you need something like a fusion, uh, those are great. There's other great alternatives like disc replacement. Uh, they work incredibly well, especially in the cervical spine of the neck that allow you to preserve motion. Um, but those are also um, augmented or enhanced by knowing the exact GPS coordinates of where they should go. And one can make a pretty strong argument that for some of the regenerative medicine things and for the disc arthroplasties or disc replacements where instead of doing a fusion, we take out the disc and we put it in a device that allows you to keep moving that segment, but that requires a lot of technical skill. It's a much more technically demanding surgery than doing a fusion. And so if you have something like a GPS or navigation or robotic systems, that can help you place that in the perfect position because all of us are different. All of our necks are different. All of our sizes are different. And so one size doesn't fit all. Um, and so as a result, if we know exactly the size that you should have before you get the surgery, we can put it in precisely, that disc replacement is going to work a lot better in the future. Um, and also things for regenerative medicine, being able to place an injection in the right spot. Uh, some non-operative uh, modalities and methods to make sure that if you're going to get injection between two bones in your low back, make sure it's exactly between those two bones and make sure it's exactly close to the nerve that's being pinched. That's going to give you much more reliable, much more accurate, and much better ability to improve after those non-operative methods as well. This is a very important point. Right. In patient selection, you know, we could talk a, a lot about that, who's appropriate for a surgery and articulating that to a patient. That's very difficult sometimes, right? So patients hurt, right? You have neck pain, you have back pain, you have arm or leg pain with it, and you want that gone, right? And we understand that. But when, when a surgeon explains to you that a certain procedure doesn't make sense and is not going to get you to those goals, like that's, that's hard conversation a lot of times. And a, a good example is, you know, we all use robotics in our practice, right? And we believe in robotics. I use it for a very select group of procedures that I, uh, that I offer, right? And I love the robot, right? But in my hands, there are certain procedures that it doesn't add value at, in the current state. It doesn't make me better and it doesn't give the patient a better outcome. And so I'll have folks come see me and say, hey, I want, I want this robotic surgery. And I'll say, I think this procedure is better for you and going to give you a better outcome. And I'm not going to use the robot, right? And I think that's what you're getting at with patient selection. It's almost 
toolbox selection and tool selection, right? So within my toolbox, I have X, Y, Z, and I think that this is going to make you better. And it's not the d fancy new technology. It's not the disk replacement. Right? So I, you guys, uh, uh, folks that do a high volume disk replacement, how often do patients come to you and they've been to eight surgeons, which is good. You need intel. You need information, right? And the previous seven said you need a fusion. And they're looking for, they're looking for an answer that's not the right answer. Right, so there's this in between that I, we want you guys to be educated. We want you patients to understand the options out there, but you can't get so stuck on a piece of technology or a certain procedure that doesn't fit your problem, right? And it's not going to give you what you want. So I think that's really important to understand. You know, come see us for a potential robotic surgery. But if we feel that that technology isn't going to help you, and we tell you that, that's not bad or sad. It's just we're trying to offer you the best outcome possible. That's such a good point. Informed choice doesn't mean make your own choice. Correct. It Correct. means have an informed conversation with an expert who you trust. Correct. Uh, that's such a good point, Dr. Yeah. I tell patients all the time, I think one of the most common mistakes that patients and surgeons make is doing the procedure that you want to do or having a surgery that you wish you could have, right? right? Like, right. no question, I don't want spine surgery. Yeah. If I have to have spine surgery, I want it to be the smallest spine surgery possible. Right. Right. But sometimes you can't solve a big problem with a little solution, right? right? And so it's all about understanding kind of this spectrum of, of treatment, right? So for certain conditions, if people are getting pain from a bad disc, and I, I would probably push back on around 50% with the surgical treatment, but there are people where we can make tremendous improvements in their quality of life by injecting regenerative medicine. There's been papers here we have a paper on, on injecting bone marrow into the discs. Another person presented on stem cells. There are some times that we can really make a huge improvement in someone's quality of life with something very small and very safe. There are times when putting in a little camera or zapping something with a laser or a, an ultrasound through a very small surgery can fix your problem. And if you had to have a spine surgery, boy, that one's probably the least painful and the easiest to go through. But there are other times when people get instability, curvatures of their spine. And sometimes we can't apply these little teeny surgeries right. to those kind of problems. And so to get it right the first time has to be a huge priority. And, and that's where you really have to understand yeah. what is the problem. And you know, if my problem can be fixed by a disc replacement, which is a surgery where you remove the disc and put in a new one so it keeps that disc moving, mm -hmm. boy, I would really like that, as opposed to a fusion, which takes away the movement of that disc. But there are sometimes it's just too far gone for a disc replacement, yeah. and that's not going to work. And so you need to choose a fusion, and that's the right treatment. And so I think that really understanding that makes sense. When it, when it comes to fusions, fusion just means eliminating movement between two bones. Okay. There are lots of different ways to fuse the spine, different approaches, and, and different success levels that go with that. So don't just get to the point of, I know I need a fusion. Now you need to figure out the best way to do that fusion. And there, is, there are a lot of different ways to go about that yeah. as well. I, I do have to push back a little bit on what Dr. Good just said. He said that you don't want a, a spine surgery. I have to say, personally, I blew out a disc in my neck. I had lost my arm strength, and I had to beg Dr. Good to operate on me. <laughs> and he did, and I got my strength back, and I'm better. So when, when you're in trouble, you're not, yeah. you're not wishing you didn't have a spine surgery. You're thankful the technology's there, and thank you for taking yes. care of me. Yeah. But, but you know, at this point, we, we've covered so much, and uh, we're going to try to wrap it up. And what we're going to do is wrap up with words of wisdom from our, our three experts here. So um, we'll, we'll let's start with Jeff, and uh, just some closing words about whatever aspect of spinal health care you want to share with the public. Yeah, so uh, I think it's important for patients to be informed, right? And I think it's good to hear opinions from multiple people. But continuing kind of our last comments is, you know, be informed, but you also need to listen to the experts, right? So if, if, if people are telling you the disc replacement is not going to be the good option and multiple people tell you that, or the robot's not going to be the next best option, listen to that, right? We're here trying to help. Right? And be a little bit careful where people use X procedure for every single pathology or every single problem. Right? That's the flip side of it. That, that doesn't always end up well. I love to use a robot, but if it's not going to help you or make sense, we're not going to use a robot. So be informed and have a good relationship with your surgeon um, that, that you ultimately choose. I, I would just say, you know, ultimately this comes down to you, right? Like, we all have to have ownership of our own decisions on our own bodies, right? And you can get the best advice, but you know, 
we all have some control over how we treat our bodies, how we take care of ourselves, um, how hard we work on our rehab, and if we do have to go through procedures, are we doing everything right or not? So just going and getting advice and then moving forward with that without really focusing on, on doing your part, uh, you're just you're taking risk. It isn't going to work as well. And so I really think that you know we've talked a lot about getting uh, getting good information and taking ownership of making the right decision, which I think is critical. But there's so many other aspects, right? And and you know I I can't go out and exercise for every single person that I need to take care of. I can tell people who need to do that exactly kind of which direction. But you really ha I think have to commit yourself to that other side. The harder you work and the more you put into this, the the better your odds are of ending up where you want to be. Ron? I think all those things are incredibly important. And I think we really touched on this in the beginning is that a lot of the times when you seek uh, surgical consideration uh, for patients, it really comes down to, once again, is that person being affected by it? You know, are you able to go to work? Are you able to do the things that you normally want to do when you make your decision? And then when you get to the point where like, okay, I've tried everything. I really need to do something because I'm not living life the way I want to live it. Um, at that point is where you really want to seek advice of multiple people. And some are, the, some are not surgeons, some are physical therapists, and there are people who do regenerative medicine, um, physiatrists and pain management, uh, different things from that perspective. But then also look at this basically that if you choose to have a surgery or a procedure that's not as large as a surgery, it's really like getting into a marriage with that person, that institution, that hospital, really for the rest of your life. Uh, because as was alluded to, if you do the wrong thing the first time, you're going to be back many times. And that's one of the things I think that gets uh, a lot of patients into trouble and some of these uh, procedures get a bad name. Um, but part of that is really educating yourself, listening to uh, various aspects and various medical providers that are talking to you about these different procedures and making sure it sort of makes sense um, because it really is going to be a lifelong um, uh, connection that you're going to have with whomever you choose to have a procedure or a surgery. Well, I'd like to thank our panel. This has been exceptional. Coming to you from Chicago from a global spine education uh, meeting, we have unparalleled access to world-class experts through our spine talks. Dr. Roy, any final words? Yeah, final words are that spine surgeons have a toolbox um, of treatment options. Everything from, you know, non-operative, which means yoga, acupuncture, physical therapy, injections, medications, all the way to surgery. And oftentimes people think that going to see a spine surgeon means you're going to have to have surgery. But I think what we've heard loud and clear today is that the spine surgeon is only going to recommend surgery if it is the right thing that's going to fix your problem. So I, I just, I thank the spine surgeons for um, sharing that insight and helping people understand that going to see a spine surgeon is really seeing an expert who can help you make the right decision for taking control of your life and getting back to that life. So thank you everybody for that. Thank you.